Hello, so um, welcome to the last talk of the conference. Um, this is just work with Piros, Veronique, and Georg. And I think Georg and Piros are sitting here. Yes, okay. Um, so this work is about um, internet, uh, electronic voting and receive freeness. So I, I had to give this talk to our students in our group. So um, I prepared like what um, I thought uh, were the uh, lessons that I learned by doing this uh, research. So I will share them uh, with, with you now that you are um, paying attention to me because it's the beginning of the talk. Um, so my takeaways are that um, when we design a secure system, there is a tension between privacy transparency and usability. So here I say transparency because this is the case of electronic voting, but uh, in general it could be, you could say like security or integrity. And um, every time I try to propose something, I, I try to think where is where I'm paying the price, right? Because there is always attention. So if I have more usability, probably I have a bit less of security. Um, in the particular case of, um, of e-voting, we also have a, a, a tension, a particular tension between uh, security and functionality. In our particular case for this research, um, by security was what I meant is uh, privacy and functionality malleability because um, as far as I know, like almost every um, vote, electronic voting protocol make, makes use of uh, malleability, so you need to have malleable primitives, but you, it cannot be too malleable, otherwise you will have attacks. And uh, lastly, something that I guess we probably we, uh, we agree uh, on um, in, this, uh, in this track, in this lecture hall, that uh, formal and careful modeling of cryptographic protocols is needed to, to verify the security claims. Otherwise, uh, you know, what we do is quite complex, so maybe you think everything is all right, but uh, when you look at it more carefully, then you might find um, that is not the case. Okay. So, um, let me just state what is the, uh, um, the usual setting for uh, electronic voting. So, in my case, I'm mostly interested in unsupervised electronic voting. So, like voting by the internet. So, we will have um, our voter, um, which is going to, who is going to participate in an election. This voter has an, uh, an smart device that is able to do crypto. Then, this voter will let's say, um, log in in a, uh, in a website. Uh, she will be uh, offered a an, um, bank uh, blank ballot. Then she will enter her uh, desired voting options. It could be like uh, by typing or it could be like uh, by clicking on, a, on, a, um, on the browser. Then this device, uh, this smart device is going to usually compute an encrypted ballot. And then this encrypted ballot is going to travel through the, uh, through the internet till the uh, voting server. Then the voting server will um, store these ballots, provided that they are well formed. Uh, the voting server might be um, writing some information in a public bulletin board. And what is for sure is that by, at the end of the election, the um, uh, voting server or the electoral authorities will write in this public bulletin board some information, in particular, the result of the election. And this bulletin board is public and it can be, um, can be uh, accessed by everyone. Then when the election is finished, you get your uh, digital ballot box in your voting server. So typically, you will download it into a, a computer without internet, internet access. Then you will bring it to some kind of, of uh, um, secure room, and then um, you will use your, uh, your decryption key, if you're the electoral authority, to compute the, the result of the election. Because since we encrypted the, uh, um, the uh, voter choices, at some point we have to decrypt. It could be that this decryption key is uh, uh, threshold died, so it, like, it's distributed and several parties have to come together, or they could do it distributedly. But at the end of the election, if you want to have what we call verifiability, you will like that you have some information about the ballot box in public, and some proof that the tallying was done correctly. 
So if you want to know whether internet voting is used nowadays, it's actually being used in, um, I would say, in a dozen of countries. Here I have what I think are the, the, the most significant, uh, significant um, elections. So Switzerland, for instance, is like a pioneer in internet voting. They have been uh, experiencing with internet voting since 2004. Then we have Estonia, which has added um, internet voting as an additional voting channel since 2005 to all his uh, older citizens. In Norway, it's also a special case because it's like um, experiencing, experimenting real, uh, uh, um, making end-to-end -end verifiability for real and uh, in a usable way. And they had two uh, pilots in 2011 and 2013. Then another um, important case is uh, France. So France has offers internet voting as an additional voting channel to uh, um, its um, expatriate citizens because of, um, you know, it's difficult for them to vote. And then, lastly, we have like uh, the election that was the most important so far uh, in New South Wales in Australia last year that took almost 300,000 um, uh, votes on the internet. So if you want to know why these countries are using internet voting, well, mainly it is because they want to increase the availability of voting for its citizens. In the case of France, as I said before, is to um, increase the participation of expatriates. Because for expatriates, it's difficult to vote in person. You have to go to the embassy or consulate, and that is normally difficult. Um, and also, postal voting is not reliable, and especially, it's not very convenient. Then we have Australia. Their main motivation was to increase the participation of, and make, in, in, in particular, make uh, more convenient for voters with disabilities to vote. You can think of people with uh, mobility dis uh, disabilities or people with, that are partially blind and they want to vote um, autonomously. Um, in Switzerland, they have been experiencing with internet voting since 2004 because they vote very frequently. So if you are a, a Swiss citizen, you might be voting every year like four times. So um, you, uh, they introduce uh, this additional channel to increase the participation. And then in Estonia, they just think that, uh, you know, we are getting um, online habits, uh, voters, and then they want to, to give a, um, a voting channel for them. Now, if we think about security, um, so we have on the, on the one hand, like, uh, uh, security properties related to privacy and security properties related to integrity. In the case of privacy, we have a hierarchy of security of, uh, of properties. We have the most elementary one, which is value of privacy, that wants to warranty that a voter that follows the protocol as it's been given to, to him or her, can be warranted that his uh, or her vote is um, kept private. Then we have another uh, privacy property, which is trickier. And in this case, we have a voter which is, who is willing to uh, abuse the voting protocol in order to produce a proof um, to show to someone else how he or she voted. And then lastly, we have coercion resistance, which is a kind of um, more esoteric uh, uh, security property with respect to privacy. And now here you assume that you have a voter which is um, under the coercion of uh, a coercer for most of the time, but that at some point this voter can vote um, um, uh, autonomously and then you want that the voter can vote for the uh, uh, voting choice that uh, he or she really wants. In this case, this is difficult to achieve, and there are uh, solutions to, to achieve it, but they are not really usable. And in particular, it requires revoting. The way that this is framed in, this, in the, in the uh, attacking model requires the voter to vote many times. And that's, from a usability point of view, is not something that is desirable. So in this world, we concentrate on receive freeness. And then we have verifiability properties. Why? Because here we are, uh, this is voting, so if it's a high stake election, this is like a very sensitive operation. And now I, I am the voter and I'm using like um, computer smart devices in several parts of this, um, of this procedure, like for my uh, voting device, for the voting server, or for the counting server. So what I want is to have some ways of um, warranting that no one is changing my vote in any of these steps. So depending on which stage you are, we, uh, um, we say we have 
CASA's intended verifiability when I can detect when my uh, voting device is changing my vote, because is my voting device which is uh, running the uh, cryptographic operations. Recorded at, at CAS, this is uh, it's trying to cover the case of a uh, uh, voting server that is being attacked. And content that recorded is um, covering the case of the counting server. Okay, so receive freeness. Receive freeness was introduced as a security property in uh, 94. And the way uh, we frame it is that privacy is for an honest voter who wants his vote to be private, but receive freeness is for a voter who is willing to give up his or her privacy to show how or she, he or she voted. Now, the adversarial setting that we consider in receive freeness. So the ballot casting interaction between the uh, voting device and the voting server is not under the attack of the adversary. It's not eavesdropped by the adversary. If that is the case, then it's a, a particular case of coercion resistance. However, the voter is willing to record this interaction between the voting device and the voting server. And it is also willing, once the voter has uh, voted, to give the secret lo local data to the, um, to the adversary. In particular, like the voter could give the, uh, the, the randomness that was used to encrypt the vote. But since the adversary is not listening to the communication between the voting device and the voting server, it's also possible for the uh, um, voter to fake this interaction, okay? And now the point is that the uh, adversary wants to know whether He's given the, uh, uh, the right um, uh, uh, recorded interaction or not. So I try to depict it here in this diagram. So here we have our voter. So the, here I have the voter and the voting device, just like they are the same thing. Now the, um, the uh, voting device is interacting with the voting server. So this is here on the, uh, on the bottom. And um, then this uh, voting server at some point publish some information in the, in the bulletin board. And now we have here this uh, candidate called Donald. And Donald wants the voter to vote for, for, for him. And now, this voter has the uh, strong desire to prove to, to Donald that uh, he really voted for, for him. So now the voter uh, after uh, will uh, run some interaction with uh, his voting device with the voting server, and in particular will send like uh, his uh, encrypted ballot, and will receive some information from the, voting, uh, from the voting server. And with this information, and with some software or uh, some instruction that, let's say, the, the uh, adversary has given to the, the candidate has given to the voter, he's going to produce a receipt, okay? And if the voting protocol is to be uh, receipt-free, this receipt shouldn't be conclusive. So the uh, candidate will not be um, convinced about whether the voter, uh, the voter voted for him or not. Okay, so uh, a practical scenario that we can think of that is covered by receive freeness is, you know, if these things of internet voting in the future are going to be used, we can think of people willing to um, tweet how they voted, right, if we have a receipt. So in this case, if we have a receive free um, voting um, protocol, the voter will be, be unable to tweet how uh, she voted. So to try to see how um, we can try to achieve receive freeness, um, I will, um, we will take a look at um, a voting protocol that is, uh, that is the result of academic research that is called Helios, which has been used in, 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 um, in real elections and the point is that the difference between Helios and the uh, previous voting protocols that we have seen that, it, that are being used in real life is that Helios publishes like almost the whole ballot box, okay? This is not the case for the uh, elections that are being run today. So the uh, election authorities are reluctant to publish the ballot box. But Helios does it because it wants to be what we call end-to-end -end verifiable. So how does Helios work. Imagine we have a referendum, so I have picked like a famous referendum I, I guess you have heard of. So imagine now that, you know, 
I'm voting in the uh, uh, Brexit referendum and that I want to vote Remain. So what I will do is that I will encrypt, in this case, one, okay? Because we are going to use the Elgamal version that we, we were um, um, describing before in the first talk of this session. So I will encrypt with Elgamal this uh, one, and we, I will also attach to it a um, non-interactive zero knowledge proof that will uh, prevent my ballot uh, from being malleable. If I wanted to vote remain, uh, sorry, leave, then I will be encrypting zero. Okay, this is a referendum, you vote yes or not, in this case is leave or remain, so leave in this case is zero, remain is one. Now, as I said, we are using this uh, um, uh, El Gamal to encrypt our vote, and what we do, since we have to encode this binary string, which in this case is either zero or one, into an El, uh, El Gamal, um, group element, what I'm doing is to take this uh, uh, bit and I'm computing g to the power m. G is either g to the power zero or g to the power r, uh, one. Now, the thing is that when I decrypt, I don't get directly the, the, the vote of the voter. I have to, um, what I, when I decrypt, I get an uh, El Gamal um, group element and from this Elgamal group element, I have to recover which was the, 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 the vote of the, of the voter. We use Elgamal because it has an homomorphic property, and this homomorphic property allows us to get um, different uh, encryptions of the votes, um, add them, and then get an uh, encryption of the final result of the election. And this is actually what Helios does. So you have your uh, ballot box. Now, what you see there is, is public. So we have the name of the, um, of the voters. We have the ciphertext with their proofs. So we check that these uh, uh, ballots are well formed. Then we drop the proofs. And then we use the L L um, homomorphic property of Elgamal to compute a ciphertext that contains the final result of the election and to decrypt it. Okay. Now, there is something, there is one warning here, here with respect to privacy. Um, we have to defend ourselves against an attack that we call ballot replay attacks. So, if we will not have these proofs that render these ballots uh, non malleable, it will be possible for Eve to inspect Alice's ballot and to copy uh, the vote of Alice, which is something that ideally should not happen. Um, this is not possible, as I said, because we have this proof, and then this prevents uh, this from being the case. And in the case of Filios, the only thing that you can do to, co to copy the ballot of uh, Alice is to copy the entire ballot. Since copying, you know, is just checking for uh, duplicates, this is something, an attack against privacy that we can, um, that we can fight against. But this is, you know, what I was saying about malleability and non-malleability. Okay. So now, the receipt. So if we pay attention on how we compute our, our, uh, our vote, our encryption is just an Elgamal encryption. So if a voter is able to uh, record the randomness that we're used to encrypt, since this uh, ciphertext is, is then um, published, then it's very easy to produce a receipt because the receipt will be simply my randomness, okay? Um, because uh, once you have the randomness, this uh, encryption is deterministic. Now, it's been known and it's folklore that you can achieve receive freeness in Helios if your voting device is, you, you know, you cannot tamper with. So imagine it's like a Howard Secure module that will be computing this, um, this ciphertext, but you cannot, you cannot record the randomness. Then in this case, Helios will be receive free because you, you could not uh, perform this attack. However, this is not scalable, right? Because Having a, uh, handing a secure module to every voter is something that is expensive. So we are trying to achieve this with a variant of Filios where we don't, do, do not need a, a hardware secure module, okay? So if we have a hardware secure module, this is what I have here. There is no uh, voter anymore. Uh, it's a hardware secure module, and then you don't have a receipt. Okay, so the first contribution of this paper is a game-based definition of receipt freeness. So, since this is a definition about privacy, we have to um, use you know, the different uh, approaches that we have to define privacy. So we have three different approaches. We have what we call the idea real world approach, 
and the entropy-based approach. These are like the most natural approaches to, to define uh, privacy because in the definition itself, you intuitively see privacy. In the case of the ideal real world definition, what we say is that, you know, uh, encryption scheme is, is, uh, keeps confidentiality is that uh, when you see the ciphertext, you don't get any information from, from it. So it's like the same thing, seeing the ciphertext to, you know, see what is inside the ciphertext than just getting nothing. And entropy, of course, entropy is a very natural um, uh, way of defining privacy, but actually, game-based are the, is the, the method preferred because it's the one that is leads to easier proofs and easy, easier to, to understand, or at least that, that is our take on it. And then the game-based one is not that intuitive, but it's based on an approach that now is you know, well, well known, which is um, indistinguishability, and in the case of uh, encryption, indistinguishability of encryptions. So this is the way that we can de uh, how we can define um, ballot privacy, not yet receive freeness. And what we do is that we let the adversary to produce two ballot boxes, okay, to uh, create two worlds, the left world and the right world. And the adversary has full control of these two worlds, but he's only seeing one of them, okay? So the adversary is either looking, uh, seeing the uh, ballot box of the left world or the right world. Now, we let the adversary to choose how the honest voters vote. And in particular, he can choose whatever he wants uh, as long as it is a legitimate option. The adversary can also vote on behalf of uh, uh, malicious voters by just creating the ballot itself. But if the adversary does that, this uh, special ballot that has been created by the adversary will appear in both ballot boxes, okay? So if the adversary wants to include something different in the left and the right wall, he has to use an honest voter uh, otherwise, by only using uh, voters under uh, his control, he cannot change the two worlds. Now, the point is that if the adversary is allowed to have two uh, ballot boxes that contain different results, like in here, right? It's like, it seems that in the, um, in the left wall, the yes will, won, uh, will win, and in the right wall, it will be the no. Of course, we cannot give to the adversary the real result of the election because otherwise it's just trivial to know whether he was in the left or the right world. So what we do is that we say to the adversary, look, in this game, you will always get the left result and we are going to give you simulated pro proofs of tallying, okay? And this is something which is like kind of um, expected in crypto because it's like saying that these tallying proofs are zero knowledge. So this is uh, a security definition that uh, was pro we, we proposed last year. Now, to give you our new security definition for receive freeness, let us take a look at one protocol that we think is like, you know, it's usable and it makes sense and it can achieve receive freeness. This protocol doesn't use, make use of a Howard Secure Module. So, this idea was proposed in 2011 by a bunch of people. And now, here I have, you know, the ballot is uh, what I depict in there. And in, with boxes, I have like, the structure of the ballot that is common with Helios, okay, which is a ciphertext and a proof of well formness. Now, this ballot also has a very uh, signing key that is unique to the voter and a signature on the ciphertext. Okay, this is what they are adding. But actually, this proof and this ciphertext and these signatures, they are like, you know, they are advanced crypt uh, cryptography primitives, and in particular, all of them are re randomizable. So you can re randomize them and even without knowing the contents of the, uh, of, the, of the vote, and get, you know, a valid ballot, but containing a completely um, independent and not related to the uh, randomness, not related to the previous one. So what they do here, the idea is that before getting into the, um, into the ballot box that then will be published, there is some intermediate step in which a re -rando uh, randomization server will re-randomize. The, um, the ballot. So when you, you will have this ballot there, you will pr produce a different looking ballot, but by the security properties of this primitive, the contents of the ballots are unchanged. So now, you, uh, the aim of this is that now you can publish the last ballot, okay? Because this ballot, the randomness that is inside, is not controlled by the voting device anymore. So you can publish it. And if you have the initial randomness, you have nothing. Okay, 
So in particular, what we see is that in this protocol, the ballot casting procedure is non-interactive. There is no information coming back from the uh, voting server to the, uh, to the voter. And this is actually what we exploit to come up with our new uh, definition of uh, receive freeness, which is game-based. Um, we only cover protocols that have uh, a ballot casting procedure which is not interactive. Now, what we are going to do is that in the published ballot box, we are not going to publish necessarily the ballots as they are produced by the voting device. We are uh, going to uh, publish a transformed version of those ballots, okay? And then we give access to a new oracle to the adversary with respect to the uh, ballot privacy adversary where we, leave, we let the adversary to produce its own ballots and the adversary now can um, send ballots that have been crafted by himself, and they can be different in the left and the right walls. That is the only thing that we do, okay? So in the case of Helios, this transformation is just the identity, okay, the identity, the identity function. So if we leave the adversary to uh, include uh, ballots that are completely controlled by him, so in particular he knows the randomness, in the left and the right ballot boxes, you know, once he makes such a call, if he has two, he submits two different ballots in, um, to these boxes, he can break this uh, trivially because he just put something different in the left and the right walls. So if he sees uh, that is BL, then he knows it's the left wall, otherwise it's the right wall. So this is why with this definition, you know, it's a sanitization measure of, our defini of, the, of the definition to see that Helios is not receive free. It, Helios is not receive free with our definition. Um, we claim that Helios with uh, our secure model is receive free because essentially it's trivial. The adversary is not able to call this oracle if he has a hardware secure model. This oracle that allows you to put uh, malicious, malicious crafted uh, um, ciphertext different uh, ballots in, uh, which are different. Now, how, why we call our definition stone receive freeness? We call it stone receive freeness because in this setting where the voting server is not giving anything back to the adversary, it's easier for us to achieve receive freeness. Why? Because if you don't get anything back, it's like the adversary is forced to play all its strategy before um, interacting with the server. And it will not, have any, uh, uh, it will not get any help from the, from the server to be able to to, um, to produce a receipt. Okay, so our second contribution is to show that this protocol that we liked is actually not receipt free, okay? And actually what we show is that this ballot replay attack is possible to be implemented here and what is worse, in an undetectable way because uh, as we said before, for Helios, if you replay the ballot, you have to replay the whole thing so I can check when you are trying to replay. But in here, um, I, I will not cover the details, but the idea is that, you know, all these primitives that all these com components that we have in here, they depend on some randomness. And all this randomness we can play with. So the um, idea of the attack is that once you see this um, uh, ballot with this R prime, S prime, T prime, and you are the adversary, a malicious voter, any malicious voter can copy this ballot by creating you know, the, a ballot containing the same contents but co with independent randomness, which is the, uh, um, the last line that I have in here, okay? This R, um, R bar, S bar, T bar. So you can copy a ballot undetectably. Okay, so, um, you know, the lesson. And then the third contribution is that we repair this protocol, we formally uh, uh, analyze it and prove it secure, and implement a proof of concept of the uh, repair protocol. Um, so we call our protocol Bilinius Receive Free because um, if you see what the authors proposed in two th back in 2011, it really fits into uh, the Bilinius framework, which is uh, um, an improvement of Filios. Um, so, 
you can see the details, you can look at the details in the paper. Actually, what we do is to um, compute a level encryption of the, um, of the vote. And level means that okay, I can put some tag in the, uh, in the ciphertext, and the tag that I put is the signing key, uh, sorry, the um, public signing key, public verification key belonging to the, uh, to the voter, okay? So uh, that's the main idea. You know, there are some technical challenges that we were uh, able to, um, to solve. And um, so we have, um, we have built a, you know, just toy implementation in JavaScript of, this, uh, of the ballot casting procedure. So this uses bilinear pairings. This proves that we see that uh, are randomizable. Our growth are high proofs, so is, they are like heavy, heavy weight. So um, if you consider a telephone like the one that I have in here, which is like, um, you know, just from, um, from 2006, but 250 pounds. Um, if you take this K uh, equal 10, it's like an election where you will have like 1,000 candidates, which is, you know, probably uh, an exaggeration. If we um, compute the result of the election by using a mixed net, then uh, our toy implementation takes 10 seconds to compute the, uh, the, the ballot. Now, our implementation uses a single core, and uh, if you go from 10, k equals 10 to k equals 7, which will be like a standard election, then on multi-core, I think this could be like two, three seconds, which, um, it could be used um, um, for a real election. Although it would be nice to, to improve the, um, the running time. So we can protect also, as uh, Helios does, using the same procedure uh, mechanism um, against a malicious uh, voting device that would like to change the vote of the, of the voter without providing a, a receipt. And um, so um, we proved that this uh, new uh, fixed protocol is uh, strongly receive free and under the decision of the firm assumption in uh, symmetric pairing groups. And um, we have end-to-end -end verifiability if and only if voters know their signing keys. And now, this is a trade respect with um, respect to usability for this uh, modification of, uh, of uh, Belenios. Um, which, you know, Belenios, I, I haven't covered in here, but the idea in Belenios is that the, the voters do not need to create the signing keys themselves, because if the voters need signing keys, then it gets, you know, from a usability point, uh, point of view, it's, it gets difficult. In this case, we lose, uh, we lose uh, that property of end-to-end -end verifiability. We need the voters to have their own signing keys. So, you know, this could be used in countries like Estonia, where they have identity cards with uh, signing keys, also Spain, but not in general. So this, this is the caveat. So this is the end, and I would just like to advertise an opening that we have in our, uh, in our group for a lectureship in computer security. So please, um, you like to come to the uh, UK, even after Brexit, come to talk to me. That's it. Do you have time for questions? I have a comment to make. On one of your first slides, you actually sh uh, showed the, uh, the Goldwasser Michali 1984 paper. And you said in there that uh, they actually introduced a game approach for proving uh, the security of encryptions. Uh, yeah, there. It shows that you never had a paper. This is not in that paper. So if you read the paper, you will see there's a very different definition in there. And it has, and people independently have shown that the definition, which I think this came from Shub afterwards, that this definition is equivalent to what's actually in the paper. But it requires a few pages to prove it. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, thanks for the presentation. Uh, you said end-to-end -end verifiability only if voters know their signing their own signing keys, could you uh, give more information about that? Um, and also, does this mean that we have a kind of trade-off here? So we are 
uh, lowering um, integrity protection for the sake of a higher privacy protection or or I'm misunderstand okay thank you for, for the question um, Okay, so um, in Belenios and also Belenios Receive Free, we have this. Uh, we have two sorts of credentials. We have credentials like in Helios, which are credentials that allow you to access the ballot box, the voting server, and it's like login path, login password combination. But now we need to sign our ballots, so we need. Uh, we have. Uh, a different uh, second type of credentials, which is just a, a, a pair of signing keys, verification and signing key. Now, Belenios is built under the assumption that there are two, ent two uh, um, en different entities, the voting server and the regist uh, a registrar that handle different credentials. And it works under the assumption that they are not at the same time corrupt for uh, end to end verifiability. But the registrar in particular, because we want to use ability in, in Belenios, can know, can know the, um, the signing key, okay? Because it will create it for the voters. In our case, if we will mimic this in Belenios Receive Free, then it will be possible for um, uh, a ballot box um, and a registrar that collude together to change the, um, uh, the ballot, the, the, the vote in the ballot, Undetectably, okay? Because the, let's say the voting device will, um, the idea is that since you can re-randomize, you can change the, um, uh, the ballot, and the ballot that you obtain, it's just completely, uh, you, cannot link, uh, you cannot know whether it, it contained the, uh, the initial vote or not, okay? If someone else can sign on behalf of you. If it's only you, then there is no problem. So there is actually a trade-off but it's between, let's say, verifiability, integrity, and um, usability. Because we think this is more usable than asking the voters to keep a pair of signing keys and the secret key has to get, you know, certificates, so on and so forth. If there are no further questions, then let's thank the speaker again.